Welcome to the 21st Century Local History Club. What might your name be? Tom Perry. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you, Ashley. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Akron, born in uh, 1941, and uh, spent all my life in Akron, except for a few years when I went away to college. You started Perry's Ice Cream. Uh, that's not quite true. My grandfather started Perry's Ice Cream. And it was actually an inspiration by the Akron school system that, that started uh, the ice cream part of the, the business. My grandfather actually started uh, the business as a milk distribution business. He bought a, a small milk route in the village of Akron in 1918 and distributed milk to the, to the local homes. And then uh, in the early 30s, uh, the Akron school system was looking for a supply of ice cream for the students. And, uh, he kind of volunteered to make ice cream for the school. So that's uh, where we started, or he started making ice cream for the Akron Central School. So there's a lot of history right here in, in Akron and <laughs> in the school. And uh, Miss Ellen Cherry, as, which she was uh, passed away recently in the, her early 90s, she was uh, Ellen Brusky, but her uh, maiden name was, was Ellen Cherry. And, and uh, I can remember my grandfather always talking about Miss Cherry. and then. Uh, we also had a be my grandmother's sister that was involved, uh, Elma Blackmore, and she was at, in the, working at the school at the time. So Ellen Cherry and uh, and Elma Blackmore were instrumental in convincing Grampy to make some ice cream for the school. When did Perry's ice cream start? Well, actually, we start. If you call that the start of making ice cream, that was in the early 30s. Now, I can't put an exact date, but we think it's 1932 and then uh, started making it uh, for the school system and then some local customers and uh, did it all in uh, what we call with a batch freezer and then uh, put it in metal. I still remember some of the metal cans, metal five gallon and two and a half gallon cans and then they would uh, take it to the different retail stores and in those days instead of buying a half gallon of pint of ice cream you'd go to the store and you'd get a hand pack and they had these little cartons and they would, would hand pack ice cream out of these. Of course, you didn't have refrigeration in your home, so you would go down to the store and get this little hand pack of ice cream and go home and then serve it immediately. So it's refrigeration has done an awful lot to expand the, the ice cream business. And as we think of the ice cream business today and how we consume it is entirely different than, than it was done in the, in the early 30s and, and 40s. Well, then that might answer the next question. When was it open? Well, we take that date, 1932, and then uh, um, was the start in going from regional. He bought the first business, as, as I recall, and that was in the late 30s. It was uh, called Frontier Ice Cream in Buffalo. It was on East Ferry Street in Buffalo, New York. And that's what got him into the city of Buffalo. And uh, it was a small ice cream manufacturer. And then uh, uh, they started distribu distributing ice cream in, in Buffalo. And by that time, they were starting putting it in packages, you know, made square pints. and. It was all hand filled, but it was all uh, expanded that way. It started to make some novelties. Uh, I think my father told me he bought the first uh, molds for making stick items uh, at, at the dairy show in Cleveland in 1936. And they just literally bought a couple of molds, and then they would uh, literally put ice cream in these molds, put them in the freezer, and let them freeze, stick a stick into them, and it was all done by hand. So the original materials or ice cream bars were, were actually made out of a static mold, so to speak, and uh, done strictly by hand, hand operation business. When did you start working at Perry's? As soon as I walked across the street. <laughs> 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 I guess technically I got my first paycheck when I was about 13 years old. I wasn't quite legal, but I was helping out, so. But uh, I, ever since I was able to be there, I was involved one way or another. How did Perry's Ice Cream impact you? Well, I guess it was pretty much my life, and I decided at a relatively young age that uh, I enjoyed it, and I thought there was an opportunity to, to do something with the ice cream business, and uh, I didn't really know any different, I guess. So when I did my planning for education and so forth, I planned that uh, I would uh, complete my education here at Akron Central and then go for a college uh, entrance course, and attended Michigan State University for a four-year uh, food science course uh, in dairy and business. So I got my technical background at uh, Michigan State. 
so I'd made up my mind relatively early that uh, I was one of the few college kids that knew exactly who was going to do. <laughs> so a lot of kids go to college, they have no idea what they're going to do, but uh, I knew what I wanted to do. So. Why did you pick Akron to start Perry's Ice Cream? Well, I didn't. Uh, it was done by by uh, my family, really, my grandfather and my father. And uh, we kind of inherited the business. So, yep, didn't have much to say about that one. <laughs> How did you feel when people were talking about Perry's? Well, you always feel good when it's positive things. Of course, there's definitely been some negative issues over the years, and those are kind of hard to to take, but uh, the positive side, I think that the image of Perry's and the quality and what we've done for the for the ice cream industry and for a business, I think is, is quite gratifying. It's uh, kind of neat to, like I can remember telling a guy a number of years ago that I didn't want to be known for making the, the most ice cream, but I wouldn't mind being known for making some of the best ice cream. I think we've attained that. I so. think you've done that. Yeah. What motivated you to go into the ice cream business? Well, like I said, I did, really didn't know a lot of different things, and, you know, my family had been in it, and uh, they at least made a living out of it, and it, it's a fun business, because, you know, you're doing things that are that are fun and, and people enjoy, and a lot of flexibility, and, you know, we had the choice of going the milk route, which to me is pretty much a commodity, because we were in the milk business as well, <laughs> or the ice cream business. The ice cream business offers you a lot more opportunities with, with flavors and type of products, and a lot more opportunity to do things different and as you mentioned before the interview that you like those those lime buddies or uh, those new like a creamsicle bar yeah. and, and that's some of the the neat different things you can do that you know with, with, with milk it's it's you know what can you do make it white chocolate or cherry or something but a lot of opportunities in the ice cream how many years has Perry's ice cream been in business well, we're going to celebrate our 85th year this year, so it's 85 years a business, and it wasn't all of his ice cream, but it's uh, evolved into strictly ice cream and ice cream products. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> How much ice cream do you make a day or every day? That's a good question. The last two days, <laughs> we haven't made any. We had some real problems. We, a lousy $2 pin shut the whole plant down. But anyways... Uh, we make about you know, 10 to 12 million gallon a year, so what's that break down to it? Uh, yeah, a couple hundred thousand gallon, I guess, in a week. Can you tell me some history of Perry's ice cream? Yeah, a lot of history. Okay. W where do we start? Great. Start where you want. <laughs> <laughs> start where you want. <laughs> well, some of my earliest memories of, of, of Perry's were, I would say, about the time of the war. I can remember going down with my mother to the, because we lived on Hart Street at the time, to get down the, 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 the dairy, as we called it, and uh, of course it was milk roots and uh, uh, small plant. And I remember drums, these barrels sitting outside, and they were actually sweetened condensed milk. Well, during the wartime, sugar was a commodity that was not available. You, sugar was rationed. So for, to get enough sugar sweetness to make ice cream, we had to buy sweetened condensed milk, and that was, I can still remember those barrels of sweetened condensed milk that we would uh, receive. I don't know if it was an imported product or where it came from, but that was a source that uh, that we would have for, for sugar, to uh, for the sugar in the product. I can remember filling square pints. I remember a woman by the name of Clara Nice, she, she retired at 72 or something like that 20 years ago, and sitting there in a 150 gallon hour freezer filling square pints by hand and uh, a lot of the operations were done done by hand and uh, I can remember we all had those nutty buddies of those cone items and uh, I can remember making those by hand and you had a hose with a double sp uh, spitter on it you go down through a row of cones like that and, and uh, fill a tray of cones put them in a the hardening freeze them and bring them back and, and package them put the, the wraps on them so I remember a lot of that hand stuff and you talk about stick novelties, and I was talking to Brian about that the other day, and he does not remember making novelties on a on the old brine tank, as we called it, because uh, he remembers the vital lines, the automatic stick machines with the old uh, brine tanks. And I remember installing one and in, came in in 1953, and the brine tank would hold uh, 36 moles. It was about four moles wide and nine moles long, I think it was. And each mold would have 24 
individual novelties in it. Well, you fill those molds up with ice cream or popsicle mix, whatever you want to make, and put them in the in the brine tank. This brine tank was at about 50 below zero, so that that would take would freeze the product in the molds. And then you drop a stick rack into it, and the, the rack held the sticks, and that would just because it was soft at that time, you drop it in there. And then as the as the product was pushed through this brine tank, it would gradually get frozen stiff. And then you get to the other end, you'd take that mold out and put it into a steam hot water tank and uh, pull the stick mold out the top. Then you ended up with your 24 uh, stick items uh, and then put them on a little conveyor down to where the girls would, would individually pack them. But I uh, uh, can remember running a lot of a lot of stick items that way and uh, it's uh, kind of neat. but. Uh, the way that in half gallons, I remember doing a lot of half gallons by hand, and I remember we thought it was a big deal. We brought the first automatic half gallon machine, and it could fill half gallons automatically. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, the, the one of the biggest steps that we we made was in, in 1982 when we decided to to build a manufacturing facility because we, we the plant we were in at Pearl Street, you know, we just physically had outgrown that, and uh, we would not be in business today if we hadn't have. Uh, build a new production facility. So that was probably the most significant thing we've we've done as a business is take that gamble and and kind of mortgage the mortgage the whole place to uh, to build that ice cream facility, which has worked out quite well. It's it's been a uh, it's almost a state of the art uh, ice cream manufacturing facility, and it uh, not the biggest in the country, but it, it's, it's certainly a respectable size plant, and it's. Uh, Done quite well, and it's, it's allowed us to grow and, and build the business. And as I recall, we moved down there in seven in '62. We had 72 employees, and now we're pushing 350. So, mm -hmm. you know, besides growing the, the business, it's done a lot for the for the community too, as as far as the jobs and, and, and pride. Yeah, pride and so forth. So, um, that if you want to get into some specific uh, things, maybe just you know. Maybe I'll also open up and ask some more questions on, on history, and I don't know just where you want to get on that, but I want to talk about some of the packaging revolutions and oh. some of the things that have happened there over the years. That, uh, uh, one that I would like to mention is the, the Perry Scroll. We all know the Perry's emblem. Uh, the, we call it the Perry Scroll. And that was developed uh, in the 50s uh, by a company that, that uh, made uh, pint containers. And uh, we decided, or my father decided, they ought to make a round uh, deluxe or super premium pint. So they, in that time, uh, most of the pints of ice cream were in the little square packages. Well, this company came up with this round pint, and then they designed the scroll uh, that was put on there with said the Perry's ice cream on it. And at that time, it was done in green and, and cream colors, I recall. And it was a number of years before we changed it to red. But uh, that was how that scroll evolved. And I can remember. When I first got involved in the business after college, which was in '63, that uh, we started to take that scroll idea and, and use that as a company logo, and, and take it through the the full product line and put it on the trucks and put it on the packaging letterheads and you know everything else and and that's how that uh, that emblem or that scroll got developed. And there's only been one minor besides color change. It was you know like I say it was green and cream colors. I recall the first ones, but then we went to the red image and then. Know, about eight, ten years ago, we we kind of softened the old English up and, and brought it more up to date. But that's the only real change that's been made in that scroll in 50 years. So. Before you leave the Pearl Street area, do you remember anything about the meat locker? Oh yeah. The Pearl Street, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in 1943, I believe it was, my dad and grandfather particularly got the idea that uh, frozen food locker would make a lot of sense because you, you think about in those times we did not have home freezers and people would would put their frozen goods, they, they, they liked the, a lot of people were farmers of course, they would butcher, then they would have a, a supply of beef and so forth, and they had a place to store it. So the concept was, and it was not just in Akron, but pretty much across the country, these, these frozen food lockers. And what they were was a low temperature place where you'd go in and you rented a space, a, a roller drawer or thing that, that you could store and you had access to that. So you, you had your own key, you could go in and get your frozen stuff out. So in 1943, my father and grandfather built such a facility for for a locker plant, and then we did uh, some butchering too. We didn't, we never did any slaughtering, but we did uh, the butchering and, and wrapping of the meat and so forth, and quick freezing it. And then we would put it in these lockers for people, or 
they could, of course, bring their own stuff in and put in, in this frozen food locker. And, and then it was after the war. It, it didn't last long. That was one of those businesses you got in just about the time that it was, it was going down the, the other side of the curve. But uh, because after World War II, uh, the, the home freezer was developed. And everybody started to buy home freezers. So then that eliminated the need for the, the locker service. So we would time gradually converted that locker facilities. We didn't have people to rent it into ice cream storage. So it, it had a dual purpose for us, and, and thank God, because otherwise it, it would have been a business that uh, would have not, uh, we, we, but because we could use the facility, <coughs> it kind of saved our, our neck on that one. But And we smoked. I remember at the, uh, we used to cure hams and bacon, and uh, we had a facility in the basement where you could uh, salt. 430 uh, detention is being held in room H205. I repeat, 430 detention is being held in room H205. We would uh, smoke uh, hams and bacon and so forth. I remember as a kid doing that and pumping the hams with, with salt water <laughs> and bacon, yeah. and putting them down, and and then running the smokehouses. And uh, it's kind of neat. Pretty much how the meats were preserved, though. Before yeah, that was, that was uh, uh, right. Smoking is a way of preservation. Yeah, yeah. And you, once once they were cured and smoked, you could. Uh, I remember we'd hang them up there in the hallway there, and it would be at ambient temperature, and uh, stuff would keep almost indefinitely. So. Now yeah. we're so scared of all that. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Would you like to tell any more history about Perry's, <laughs> or uh, uh, you have any more stories? Oh, I could go on forever, but uh, well, you could just get an area that, that. What area would you have some interest in? That. Uh, How about the flavors. Okay, flavors. About the process of well, naming the flavors or coming up with them. How do they settle? Okay, flavor, flavor selection. Is, it traditionally been through what we call flavor houses. Now these are people that, that manufacture the ingredients that we put in in ice cream. And, and they may be, uh, you know, like Stark A. White's an example. They're, they're uh, people that, that make candies and crunches. And I think you remember our butter cruncher, Swiss chocolate chip and things like that. Uh, uh, the flavor houses develop the concept and then they try to sell you the flavors, uh, their flavors to put in the product. So a lot of ice cream flavors have been developed that way. Um, but not cook specialties, right? Well, cookies and cream is one that uh, a fellow in um, Rochester, he was in the card company, he kind of got that idea. He used to break up Oreo cookies and put it in vanilla ice cream, in our vanilla ice cream, and he told us about it. And I think we and another company in Texas were the first ones, I think uh, Bluebell in Texas started doing about the same time. And uh, that probably became one of the biggest hits as a new flavor. In fact, I remember when that actually outsold vanilla for a period of time, the cookies and cream. Um, we have certainly developed some flavors on our own. Uh, you mentioned the Sabre Sunday. That was that was a concept that, that we put together on our own. And some of the, the, the newer novelties that we've been doing, uh, the, the lime, it's, it's not rocket science to take put the lime sherbet on top of vanilla ice cream, but, it's, <laughs> but it is something different. And, so for the uh, no sugar added, just talking to the fellow down there now, the, the no sugar added products, I think there's some real opportunities there. And we're going to, we've got the product, we're, we're going to take that another stage. There's, there's, there's better sweeteners and, and it's a constant upgrading and, and changing of products and looking for, for new ideas. And uh, the Bob Denning, uh, our, our president and my son-in-law, had the idea of the of the bakery line and, and coming up with a piece of cake and uh, German chocolate cake and the lemon what was, that, what was the one last summer lemon chiffon or something like that pie there's a lot of the, the, that whole bakery and, and building a series around that and uh, it does make sense to to do that take an, and try to build a series of flavors around a concept and that that bakery line was one and of course the the, the new uh, indiscretion pint line is, is a is an app, uh, bunch of, we, we developed that line. Now we did have some, some input there from a, a unique new flavor company uh, that's developed some of these exotic flavors, but uh, depends on where things go there, but that, that could be a good opportunity depending on what happens in, in the, the super premium market with Ben and & Jerry's and haagen because there's, there's some, some major changes going on there between the ownership and uh, uh, what's going to happen long term with, with those two companies. So. What types of flavors are in that indiscretion line? Yeah, I, to be honest you right now, I don't remember the, the something off sinful and. Oh yeah. Oh, they're they're they're, 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 they're neat flavors. Yeah, uh, 
We should probably get that, that list of flavors. I, I can't remember them offhand, and I'm not good at remembering flavor <laughs> names, but you were but yeah, the, the, there's some good ones, and there's there's a coffee one I, I particularly like, and yeah. How many flavors would you say you're putting out now? Oh, at any time, we, if you look across the, the total total board, there's probably 75 to 100. Because wow. we probably in bulk alone, bulk ice cream, we probably run 50 flavors. And then uh, you've got the low fats and you've got the yogurts. And then you've got the half gallon line. There's some flavors there that don't duplicate in bulk. There's quite a bunch. So what is your best seller? Yeah. Vanilla, yeah. Still vanilla? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about transporting your ice cream back in the olden days. Okay, the, the first transportation of ice cream was done in what we call dog houses. And what the hell is a dog house? But, uh, of course, in those days we had the milk delivery and, and the, we delivered milk out of the back of a pickup truck. And if you can imagine, I remember a little Ford pickup truck and uh, <laughs> The crates would stand too high in the back, and then you'd throw an insulated blanket on top of that. And then, of course, summertime, you'd take the little ice and throw some ice on it. That's how you kept the milk cold in the pickup truck. Well, then to get the milk pedal by noon, 1 o'clock, uh, they had some ice cream delivered, so they'd go back to the plant, and they had what they called the doghouse, which was a small refrigerated box, mechanically refrigerated box, and we'd slide that on the pickup truck. And then we could put ice cream in that and, and take the ice cream to the different stores with this pickup truck. And uh, I can still remember as a kid using these dog houses to run special orders, particularly like running the, the ballpark in Buffalo for the when it used to be down Hofferman Stadium. And uh, they, that's kind of one of my little runs I used to do quite a lot, run 100 boxes of Cheerios down there to the, to the ballpark. And, uh, but that you did it with, a, with a, basically a pickup truck. And then, as I recall, I can remember a 1941 Dodge pick or Dodge truck. It had about three doors on it. It was actually ammonia refrigeration, and that would that was refrigerated by the the plant, the the manufacturing plant's refrigeration system. You had a couple of flexible hoses that you hook onto the refrigeration system, and uh, it would actually be refrigerated or cooled off of a off the main plant. And then during the daytime, it had what we call holdover plates or refrigerated plates in there and that would maintain the coldness uh, when you ran the truck and you brought it back at night hooked it back onto the plant refrigeration system well then uh, with time the the trucks became independent they had their own refrigeration system on them and they're, they're freon systems and they had these whole cold plates and when you had them in the in the yard at night you r ran the refrigeration system and that would cool them down, and, and then uh, during the daytime, these hold plates supposedly would, would keep them cold. But I know lots of times you get back in at 6, 7 o'clock at night after being out on a hot day, and, and those trucks <laughs> were not too cold. You could probably pour as much ice cream out of the cartons as was still in them. But uh, yeah, they got pretty soft. Of course, you still today. can't travel too far. Well, today it's, it's all over the road refrigeration. There are all these carrier units, and uh, what's the other one, uh, big name, uh, that. Uh, not tree automobile, but uh, Thermo King. Thermo King, and, and they have constant refrigeration so that they're automatic. And yeah, these trailers. And today we're probably running well over 100 units of refrigerated between trailers and state trucks and so forth. And they all have the, the over the road refrigeration today. So, And there's a couple of advantages. And number one, of course, you have refrigeration constantly. And, and the other is, is they're a lot lighter because the, the ones with the holdover plates, I mean, you had probably a ton of refrigeration refrigerated plates in there and now it's uh, just a matter of a, a unit that circulates cold air instead of the, the holdover plates so that's that's changed a lot how far is your territory now that you cover selling ice cream well their own distribution we're pretty much doing New York State now um, Pennsylvania um, northern Pennsylvania a little bit into Ohio, up in New England. In fact, we just hired a person to represent New England and then one down around Philadelphia area. So we hope to, now some of that will be done with other distribution companies, Not we won't distribute it all ourselves. It'll be done through relationships with other, and we do a fair amount of that. We sell product to distributors and then they and their fleet of trucks uh, distribute products and uh, we do a fair amount of that. There's a, 
guy down in Binghamton, New York, we've worked with for a number of years, and uh, he's been a very good distributor, and he, he handles, and there's one down in the Hudson Valley, and uh, there's working, they're working one now up in New England, and because uh, it's, it's pretty cost, costly to, to have a fleet of trucks to cover all the geographical area that you have to cover, so. We try to combine, and we do the same thing. We, we, we besides our own Perry's products, we, we, we take a lot of what we call partner brands, and we're distributing all the Friendlies and the Hagen Dazs and Ben and Jerry's and Nestle and some Edie's Dryers products. And now, so. does that mean that they make it, they ship it to you, and then you distribute it? Mm -hmm. Like Ben and Jerry's, all Ben and Jerry's in this area, we, we distribute all that. Mm -hmm. All the Nestle, you've seen the Nestle cabinets in the different stores? Yeah. Yeah, we do all that. Yeah. Yep. What's your connection now with overseas? Well, <laughs> that was kind of a farce, and, and uh, probably uh, you'll probably want to edit this one out. But yeah, just edit this one out. But okay. what what happened there is that uh, the people that are supplying tops also have a brokerage business, and they decided that they would, under the pretense of exporting ice cream, buy some ice cream. So when we were going to sell a load of ice cream that's going to be exported, we sell it at a, a lesser price because there's no marketing or other expenses entailed to it. So we made the deal to sell them these loads of product that were going to be exported. Well, come to find out, they went out of the state, but they turned right around and came back to Chictawaga. So it's a little bit of a scam. Sure. Yep. But you live and learn. But you're importing and distributing for Sweden. Oh yeah, yeah. We we are doing a product called Swedish Glaze, oh, which yeah. is is a uh, yeah. What's that? that? One. <laughs> yeah, uh, not yogurt, but uh, soy product, a soy-based product, oh. and quite good. I will say that it's it's a very nice product, and and it's uh, made by a company in Sweden, and we're doing the U.S. distribution of that product, and uh, they're in fact that that's going into New York City now, and I think it started into Pittsburgh to a distributor in Pittsburgh recently too, so. I can attest to how delicious You like that? It's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, your mask got periwinkle. Yep. What do you feed him? Leftover nutty buddies. That was her question. Yeah, that's her question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I. He came in under. I think Joey developed that. It's probably 15 years ago. Don't tell anyone. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Caban, yeah. I'd say it's probably 15, 20 years. Yeah. I remember the first one. It's, it's, uh, it's after 82, I know that. We did not have periwinkle at the old. What do you mean you remember the first one? The first periwinkle, you mean? Yeah, first time we, did, we developed that, <laughs> the, first, the first costume they made for periwinkle. Do yeah. you still have that? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I know we have several periwinkle outfits now. I'm not sure how old they are, how many we've had, and we just don't keep track of that. Periwinkle was here over the summer. He was quite ahead. Oh, was he? Yeah, yeah. He was a huge hit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's surprising what, you know, little Jenna, I mean, she just gets all excited over periwinkle. I mean, these kids are really... Oh, the kids are not. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It was so fun. Yeah, it's been good. It was also 100 degrees upstairs where we had to have... Oh. They were more than happy to have periwinkle's treats with them. Yes. This is the ultimate question of the interview. What was your favorite flavor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think over the years I still love butterfudge almond, and it's a flavor okay. that um, is not around today. But it, it's kind of an off chocolate flavor. It's, it's it's actually made with a product called a, a butterfudge, and it, it's had a little salt in it, and of course it has some fudge, and it. It's a little caramelized taste, but boy, that with with some some almonds is just a fantastic flavor. You remember it must butter? Must be good because Brian said it's his favorite yeah. too. Butter fudge, oh, yeah. I have never had it. Yeah, that was done. The first time that was done was when we did the Pride, the original Pride, in the round half gallons. And if you remember that, it had Brian's picture and Grandpa's picture inside of it. That was done in the late '70s, and that that flavor was. We made little of it in bulk before that. And I remember it used to get the flavor from. Uh, from Bob Limpert, Limpert Brothers, and it was, a, it was a great flavor. Do you still yeah. make it? No, not right now. Mm -mm. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that's probably the one I like to, well, there's a lot of them. I mean, I have a tough time 
staying away from any of them. <laughs> yeah, one problem I have. Why. Yeah. <laughs> They're just all too good to resist. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did you come up with the name for Perry's ice cream? It's, it's a family name. It was. Yeah, family okay. name. Yeah, it came off the, <laughs> came off the milk bottle. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, he actually started a business, H. Morton Perry. It was he had in the first bottles, and probably some of you have seen the the first glass bottles, the round ones, that had H. Morton Perry on it, and then it developed from Perry, H. Morton Perry to Perry's Dairy and and Perry's Ice Cream. And, yeah. Okay. <laughs> What are your some of what are some of your memories of Akron Central High School? Well, Akron Central. I started uh, in 19, be about 46, I believe, five wow. years old. Yeah, 46. Started out in the right corner. It was a pretty pretty good sized room, which I don't know what it is today, but it was. Superintendent's room, I think. I believe. The so. lower room over there. Oh, super no, very good. But that was the that was a kindergarten room at that time. We started there, and then Mrs. Lillian Lace, who just passed away here. Matter of fact, she was in Florida, and we saw her a year ago, and she passed away down there not too long ago. And she was a kindergarten. I think she's also my first grade teacher. They went up. That room was lower, if you remember, and then you go up a few stairs into the room to the right. The first room there was a first grade room. I had her again. Then you, I think there was two first grade rooms. You went down a couple of rooms, second. So literally went around the the bottom floor, of this the building, the main building, through sixth grade. And Mrs. Weeks, remember Arlene Weeks? She uh, had her for sixth grade. And then at that time, I can remember sitting in in the, the building over there, looking over here, and they were building this building in 1955 or whatever it was in the late 50s, but I can remember this building, there was a bus garage between them, <coughs> four or five bay bus garage in there. But uh, I remember them building, and that time we were going half day sessions. I think it was a couple of years we did half days. And then uh, sixth grade to seventh grade literally started, started again on the first floor, I think, and went around again. and. and well, remember your, your dad up in, in uh, the had biology from him, and that would be upstairs and above the above that front. Uh, it would be the the one to the south and um, mm -hmm. southwest. I didn't realize he taught biology. Oh yeah, he taught biology. Yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. Earth science when I got there. Yeah, it was earth science when you got there. But it, it, originally it was a, a biology course. Yeah, oh. yeah, he taught biology. Yeah, remember that well. Do you remember them moving the houses to build the elementary school? Yes. Did you see I remember, oh yeah, I remember walking down through, and there was, uh, Fred, what was his name, Rung used to live down in one of these houses along in here. Yeah, there was a little street here and, and several small houses in there, yeah, they moved them out. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember the, uh, I don't know what's back there now, but it used to be a well, kind of a play lot behind well, you come in the main driveway now, and then just as you just start to curve around, there used to be some steps that would go up, and there was a yard in there that uh, had swing sets and, and a big slide. There's a tall slide in there, a nice uh, slide. And then, of course, all these evergreen trees that line the property now, they, they were small trees. They were, yeah, they were, the property looks a lot different than it used to. But, uh, yeah. but just though, you've all seen pictures, I'm sure, of the building with just the, the one building when it was here. But uh, yeah, I remember that, and, and Dick Roselle being downstairs, uh, the egg teacher in the egg department, and the, the, the front basement, basement quarter. Basement. Yeah, and the cafeteria line go down there, and the the teachers had a door. The, the, everybody went through the cafeteria line, and and they had a door they could sneak through and get ahead of us. <laughs> and that was down in the basement. In the yeah. basement, yeah, and, and then the teachers ate with us, and then uh, they had a teacher's room, but uh, they went through the line with us and so forth. And I remember Fridays were always good because they. they the dietitian, she made a, a wicked sloppy joe. Boy, that was, that was a good sloppy <laughs> joe. <laughs> One of the favorites was the, the sloppy joes, yeah. Yeah, through that line. And yeah, it was 25 cents. Got your lunch for 25 cents. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the milk was in bottles. And I remember coming back. In fact, uh, the other thing I remember, too, is the, the day that, that John Kennedy was killed, uh, assassinated. Uh, 
I come up here to the school with my uncle Perry Blackmore and picked up the bottles. We always come up after one o'clock or so and pick up the bottles after lunch and bring them back to the plant. We'd come up and brought the bottles back, had them unloading the, the, the truck in the back of the dairy and uh, Mrs. Scott, remember Mrs. Scott lived across the street there, Scotty's, Wesley, Wesley Scott's wife. Uh, she came out and said uh, it's been a tragedy that uh, John Kennedy had been shot. So that would be 63 or 64, 63, I think. 63, yeah. You had graduated already? Yeah, I graduated in June. This would, this would have been November or what it was. I yeah. remember that. I was in seventh grade. Yeah, yeah, that was. Yeah, remember where it was? We all remember where we were that day. Mm -hmm. Yep. But. What clubs were you in in school? I stretch my memory. See me photography club for one. Well, I don't remember too much. Were you a singer? Did you do any of the uh, plays? <sighs> no, play sports. Did basketball and track. Uh, what else did I do? <laughs> Didn't do any swimming. I don't know that. Because we just got the that. I remember the pool coming in. That was a big deal. We opened that pool up. Yeah. Yeah, on the basketball court, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because before, it, this, of course, you people remember that at all, but the, the old gym that we had when we started school here was where the high school cafeteria is now. The back of that was the gym. Then the auditorium was, was the part where you where you eat now, the front part there where the seating is. And those doors, uh, they actually went down at one time, and, and you'd go in and go down that. And then there was a balcony. Now those, you can still see it from up above, but for years you could there was some doors up there, yeah, where you could tell where the balcony was. But uh, yeah, that little uh, little basketball court in there. And remember, a guy named Charlie Biscaro. I was probably a freshman or so, or maybe even younger than that. He had a night he shot 36 points, and he couldn't miss. It, it was, and they were all what we call three pointers today. In those days, it was only two pointers. But uh, just a fantastic night. And wow. I can remember a kid by the name of Jim Downey, and. Uh, you remember Jim Downey at all? Yeah. He was a tough kid, and and, and uh, he it was a tip ball at the start of the game. And the ball, of course, the court was was much bigger in this room, and and the, the ball went over the the cheerleaders sat in a bench on the side, and the ball went over the top of the cheerleaders out into the hallway, and he literally went right over the top of the cheerleaders into the hallway <laughs> for that ball. <laughs> and he pulled himself back up and back on the field on the court, but uh, he also oh, he was a tough kid. There's some, some neat memories there. Yeah. Daniel, you have a question? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> How is the ice cream made today? How is it made today? You need to come down and have a tour. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. really what you should Chemistry. do. Chemistry. Yeah. Because yeah. that's, that's, that's a lot to see. And you, 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 to add to this, I think, if you went down to the, the plant, and then, that, of course, that's available to anybody. We do tours, and, and we have a, a film down there, and uh, so forth. And there's a a lot of literature available on making it, but it's it's a continuous, fairly sophisticated process. I thought rocket scientists hmm? like that work at Perry's. I thought they were all rocket scientists. <laughs> <laughs> I swear it takes a lot of chemistry. Oh, it does. It, it's a lot more complicated than, than people think. Uh, there's well, no question they about it. They must be rocket scientists. Yeah, it, it's, there's, a, there's a lot involved to, to keep a manufacturing plant running and all the stuff is needed today. Just to just to get the right product, you stop and think about the ingredient labeling and, and keeping all that straight, and all the history, and the tracking today. And, and you know, you can give us the code number off a product, we can tell you what batch of milk went into it. And it's it's unbelievable what it takes to, to follow up all that that stuff today. When did you Blood stop chain. delivering milk? I would say we didn't take any to the new plant. I remember that. It was, Probably about 82. We, we were doing a little. It was down to small amount. We had a. Uh, I think we pretty much did it off of a couple of trucks, if I remember right. We just went to some stores and did a little bit of house to house. But uh, it's one of those businesses that just gradually went away because you know, the, the, number one, the people change, and then when you go back when the milk business started, all the housewives were home, so you could deliver milk, and they come out in the morning and get their milk. But now. You look at most people get up and, and both parties leave and the house is empty and so forth and they're always running by convenience stores and so forth so it's no problem getting 
milk to a home today, where years ago you either had to go to a store or it had to be delivered, and it wasn't the choices. So with time, that's all changed. You know, when you look at the economics of it, and you know, a guy wants to make a living wage, well, it's tough to make a living wage dropping three quarts of milk off at a house. It, 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 you know, and how many of those can you do an hour? And how can you, how can somebody justify? And in the, the the people are not going to pay the the margin that you need to do that. So it becomes an economic issue. And, and when you think about it, economics forces a lot of things. And, and, and economics has definitely forced that decision over the years. And there's a little bit of house to house and, and delivery service available. And well, Hermetica and the Akron poultry farm is an example where there's there's a service that's still available. It's house to house, but I mean, there's, there's a real premium for it. I mean, he has quality, but it's premium. And then there's a couple of milk. There's a guy out in Chicago that's still delivering milk house to house, and he's got a, a you know a clientele that are willing to pay that that price for the that service. But it, it, it's a rare thing today. And and you look at it, economics uh, has changed uh, even the ice cream business, and it's it's uh, mostly the supermarket volume today. Supermarkets and the big stores are are controlling it. And if you'd caught the number, but on the Friday after Thanksgiving, Walmart's did one billion dollars of sales. That's with a B. One billion dollars of sales in one day. Mm -hmm. I mean, you stop you stop and comprehend that. That's more business that, than than the country. <laughs> a lot of countries do, and they did that. So that that's the kind of things that, that you're handling today, and the, how the economics and stuff changed. You have a question. What is uh, hydrochloric ammonia used for? Hydrochloric ammonia? Yeah. No, it, it's a uh, hydro. Hydro is the refrigerant. Now, hydrous ammonia is NH3. Under this atmospheric pressure we're sitting in now would be a gas. Now, if you put some pressure on it, and I forget the exact pounds, maybe, and I know at 100 pounds of pressure, it would it would change into a liquid. Now, when and, hydro and hydrous ammonia changes from a liquid to a gas, it absorbs a lot of heat. And that's what makes refrigeration. So if you take a liquid, it's like this glass of water. If I change this from a liquid to a gas, it's going to take a lot of heat to do that. You have to boil it, right? We do the same thing with, with, with anhydrous ammonia. Anhydrous ammonia, in fact, anhydrous ammonia will, will boil at about minus 50 or 60. Well, it depends on the, on the atmospheric pressure, but if you get 10 inches of vacuum on it, we run the plant at, at, in a vacuum system, so you're actually kind of sucking on, on, the, on the gas, but you get the evaporation effect, and that's how you, how you create refrigeration, is changing a liquid to a gas, and then you take that gas and compress it, put pressure back on it again, take the heat out with a condenser or cooling medium, and bring it back to a liquid. So if you kind of think that process through, and you can think about it as, as, as water as well. If I take this glass of water and put enough heat in it to put it into a, into a gas, you have steam, right? And it took energy, it took energy to do that. Now if I want to take that steam and put it back into water, I got to get that heat out. So you got to run it through a condenser or something to remove the heat. Ammonia and hydrous ammonia is very, very similar. It's just that the boiling points are substantially different. And they're, they're very flexible and, uh, you know, for us in the, in the business, it's an ideal medium to create refrigeration and cooling, a cooling medium. Because we, we can run, the, we call, and we run stages of refrigeration, but we run it, say, at, at 10 inches of vacuum, which is a, a negative pressure on the system. Uh, and that creates about a 50 below zero temperature on the ammonia boiling. So then that gets into a gaseous state and takes heat out. So if we want to take, if we want to freeze ice cream, we take that anhydrous ammonia and spray it on the outside of a barrel of a we we'll call a continuous freezer where the, the product is going through it and being scraped off and frozen at the same time. So as that ammonia is taking the heat out, you're getting a whipping and freezing effect. And that's how basically ice cream is made. And then we get it to that point, get into a package, then we put it into a hardener, and the hardener does the same thing. That's just a blast freezer with a lot of cold air coming off of ammonia again that, that's that's evaporating. And then we take that and, of course, condense it. And one big advantage we have here in the village is the, the abandoned gypsum mines. And we use the cold water out of the abandoned gypsum mines to run the condensers, to take the heat back out that uh, we put into the ammonia. And it, it's, it's been a 
a, a neat situation for us because it's, it's a constant temperature, it's a cold temperature, and it's, it, it's quite cost effective to, to have that lower temperature water to remove the heat because then you have, because uh, there's a relationship between the pressure and the condensing point, so if you can lower the, the temperature, then your condensing pressure becomes less, and that requires less energy to compress the gas to get it back into a so you follow all that around. <laughs> how do you get that water from the mine at pumps. this point? Pumps. You pump it up? Yep. Are you on top of a mine where you're located? Yep. Yeah, we dropped in there. You can just go right yeah. down below. We, we can probably pump a million gallons a day or better. Yeah. There are springs down there, I'm assuming? Yeah. We just dropped, we, we literally dropped a, a pipe right, and I remember we did it. It's the 40, the 53 foot, if I remember right. We broke through the top of the mine shaft and it dropped about four foot. And then it, it's just open water down there and we just, Drop the casing down in there, and we, you know, with a vacuum, you put the pumps on it, and, and we, we pump constantly. And in fact, we have two systems. What's refilling that, though? Just nature. So it's There's like billions of gallons. I mean, this goes all the way to Clarence Center. So it's spring fed at some point. <laughs> well, right? that and, and surface water. I know up on Skyline there, the water comes off of Skyline Drive. That There's a place up there where it drops right down in the mines. And, really? and there's a lot of places around here that, that, that the water drops into the mines. In fact, we, we very seldom see any change. We have a vacuum gauge on that. If I remember right, it runs about eight to ten inches, inches of vacuum on that on the head of that pump, or those pumps that bank of pumps there, and uh, and that changes very very little. And the temperature is constant. I think it's 48, 49 degrees. It, it runs at just constant temperature. Which and we use it for air conditioning and everything else down there. Great. Yeah. It, yeah. It is. That's. Yeah, How about the family line? Who's going to carry that on? Well, we got Brian and then uh, son-in-law Bob. Uh, I'm very proud of them. They're they're doing an excellent job with the business. And tell us a little bit about Brian. Well, Brian is uh, going to be 40 this year. I didn't met him, but he turned 40 <laughs> in July, and uh, he is uh, doing a lot of the stuff that, that I did in the later years, the, the association work and uh, with the International Ice Cream Association and uh, outside work. Uh, does some work with the government agencies. Uh, and certainly a lot of consulting with it and a lot of work with our people because he, he knows the business inside out and backwards and uh, he's been doing a fair amount of sales work and uh, which is kind of neat because he can go with uh, particularly Copac customers or larger private label customers and yeah, he knows what can be done and he, he cuts through a lot of a lot of bull to, to get to what what makes sense and what doesn't make sense and that's uh, it's been quite in fact he's in New Zealand right now uh, Looking at a novelty situation over there, so. To supply novelties or distribute for them? Probably distribute. Yeah, that's this exciting. Is yeah, yeah. We better keep that off the tape now that it develops, but uh, <laughs> okay. that's where he happens to be now. Yeah, and then uh, Bob, one thing in our, and we did a lot of planning, and, and you know, getting a business from one generation to another is, is not an easy step. It takes more than just having the right last name, and and uh, we've been probably working on this at least ten years now. And uh, one of the criteria that we put in place that uh, who was going to be president was going to have to have an MBA. So uh, my son-in-law, Bob Denning, took the initiative to uh, do the MBA program at, at, at UB. And uh, it took him about two days to realize it was probably one of the better decisions of his life. And, uh, you know, at first, the, the guys, I can remember, they, God, Dad, what are you doing to us? What are you doing to us? We've got to go through all this. We want to just run the business. And, yeah. And uh, well, no, you're gonna you're gonna get an MBA if you're serious. So um, he took it seriously, and I remember it took about two days, and he came back and he told Gail. He said, "Well, your dad was absolutely right." <laughs> and uh, that had to feel good. Yeah, it did. It did. And uh, they put a lot of work into it. He he particular in that program, but the connections. And I would say out of I know he's got at least two or three MBA graduates out of that class now that affiliation that, that's working for us now, and it, it's. I give them a lot of credit that they've built an excellent management team, and that's that's one of the keys today. Is as, as you can see in, in whatever profession you're in, you, you need those those strong people and those people that are well qualified. Uh, What's Brian's degree in? The, in business, business, yeah. Yeah, his degree was is actually finished at the Canisius with a business degree there. He's had some advanced uh, courses. He hasn't got his MBA yet, but he's he's had some courses, and he's still doing a, a program. Uh, we have several programs that uh, through one through Canisius where uh, it's CEOs and CFOs and so forth. They're from local companies that are working together, and uh, it's been some good experience there. And he's been involved with that. And so 
so forth. So Great. Discontinuous. Yeah. And it's necessary to keep up with all this as well. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Yeah, the business has, you know, certainly changed. I, you know, you think back of what it was done, and but um, we're fortunate. We've got some some excellent people today, and that's what it takes. And you're not standing still. You're always evolving. Yep. Always changing. Right. right. Yep. 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 Had a tough week this week. PNC went bankrupt last Thursday, so that wasn't too too good. But but. Who is that? PNC. What's PNC? Or, uh, Penn Traffic. Pen Traffic Company. It's uh, they own PNC stores. Uh, no, no, it's a grocery store chain in Syracuse, headquartered in Syracuse. Oh. They they had the quality markets here. Remember the quality markets? Yep. Yeah, the quality markets. Really, the market basket. There's some market baskets in the southern tier. So, oh boy. yeah, it was. That cuts in here. Yeah, that's that's kind of <laughs> tough one, Bob. It's, it's been kind of tough day, a couple tough days in the management team, but they're working through it. So. And they will. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. Anything else you would like to add? <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. Well, like, no, you're the one talking. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> well, I'd like to, you know, answer the questions that you have. I mean, I well, certainly can reminisce for a long time. You know, I've been through all. Of it, uh, <laughs> the, uh, did, you, did you go through them all? Yeah, I went yeah. through them every single one. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Because of, uh, I know back in November there was a, a leak during the night. Does the temperature of the atmosphere outside of the tanks cause that, or is it just, is there just like a hole in the system, or is it man-made or something? That was something that we all have find very hard to believe what happened that time, but uh, it's a combination of a couple things that happened. Uh, going back to ammonia, again, we got a liquid form, we have in a gaseous form. Uh, when you lay out your plumbing system, pipes are designed to carry either the gaseous form or the liquid form. I won't say it doesn't get mixed up sometimes. Well, the main suction lines namely, mainly handle gas, the gaseous state. Well, what happened, we had a valve in one of the hardening systems that, think about it a minute, did it open or close? But anyways, it must have opened. It allowed the slug of liquid ammonia into the suction site. And then some hot gas came along behind that. So now we've got liquid going through a piece of pipe that normally has gas going through it. And it's going at a tremendous speed. And it hit, and for some reason, it was a trap built into this thing, which, I mean, a trap. The line was coming down, then it did one of these things to, to change elevation or something. And when it came down around that thing, it literally took a piece of extra heavy six inch and blew a hole right inside of it. Mm. It's, it's almost uncomprehendable of what kind of pressures it would take to blow a piece of pipe open like that. But that's, that's what happened. Now, exactly how it happened or why it happened, it's, it's hard to say. We, we've gone through, and, and one thing we've done uh, since then, that they, they've got a way. It, it's very difficult to evaluate the quality of, of a refrigeration pipe because you've got to remember it's buried in insulation. You have to insulate all these pipes, so therefore it's all covered with insulation. So you, you go through some kind of a radar, it's a radar um, x-ray, x-raying system. And we're process. we I guess, done that this last winter. Went through a uh, x-raying system to check all the piping to make sure there's no other places. And there was, we, we felt there was a hairline crack in this piece of pipe. We can find that. But, but that's one of those things that, you know, it, it's, I guess it's a, it's a risk of the business, and, and, and we've certainly had our share of them. I, I can remember probably four or five very significant ammonia leaks in my lifetime, and, uh, and uh, they're tough, and <coughs> thank God we can smell this stuff, and it, it, mm -hmm. uh, nobody's been hurt too seriously, but, uh, but I know that I remember talking to a Cal guy out in California, and they had one out there one time, and, and they, it was just unbelievable what, what kind of damage they can cause. And, this was in a high-rise operation, and uh, the other thing you got to remember too: ammonia is very conductive to electricity. So they had all these power cranes in there, and when all that ammonia got in the electrical system. All the cranes started to run. Nobody in there, and these oh cranes are all God. operating. And of course, then they lose all the refrigeration, so all the stuff starts. And this is in California, so the stuff melts, and you got these cranes running around. Oh, it was just a plain nightmare. I had no idea. That's oh. frightening. Yeah, it is. 
does it leak into the plant first or does it just leak out into the Depends air? on where the leak is. This this last one was on the roof. So that, roof. that leaked outside. Did it leak outside first? Did it affect the plant in any way, like inside? No, that one did not. We've had the the one we had back in ninety four or five whatever that one was, that was that was very traumatic because that one we lost all the ice cream. Yeah. And we threw away about eighty trailer loads of ice cream on that one. But then what, 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 what year was that? Ninety four? Yeah, ninety four I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that that was up on the roof and it, it broke and it, it went down through the panels of the roof and onto into the ice cream room and Oh, it was that was a real disaster. Good thing it was in the middle of winter time. Yeah. That one there, the one that in that January, that took us better than a week to get production running again. Yeah. That's brutal. Yeah, that was not a good Thank God it wasn't summertime. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what we'd done in the summertime. We it has happened. I was a, there's a company out in Lamar's, Iowa, the, the Wells family, and they've got two ice cream plants, and they blew one up in the summertime, and it, it, it was a fire, and it was, besides ammonia leak, they had a fire with it. Well, they had a major disaster. And, uh, well, the industry came to the fact we made some product for them. Everybody, you know, kind of put their shoulder to the wheel, and everybody made some product for them and got it through it. But, uh, so there is, there is cooperation there between, within the industry. We compete, but on the other hand, when somebody needs help, we're there to help them too. So, right. Yeah. Now, what's stored in the lagoon? What's stored in the lagoon? Everybody like talked about the smell and everything during the summer. What's well, the that's the the wastewater treatment facility, and, and see so when oh. when you're manufacturing, you end up with um, really dirty water, and a lot of it has <laughs> ice cream and dairy products and so forth in it, and it's it's the BOD, the biological demand load, is too heavy for the municipal sewer system. So we have to do what we call primary treatment. So that's we take it to the lagoon system, and the lagoon system aerates it. And now we have a, what, uh, a DAF system, which uh, takes the solids and removes the solids. It's a fairly complicated system of, of uh, treating the thing. But you know, we've, we've certainly had some tough experiences with that over the years. But again, you talk about something that's evolved and, and that lagoon system or primary treating systems came into effect with the Clean Water Act back in the late 70s, early 80s. And all of a sudden, the country decided that we've got to do things different. Well, it took time for technology, particularly the waste treatment technology, to catch up with things. And we first put that lagoon system in. I remember, oh, this will, this will work fine. Just keep putting air and doing it. Everything will be, be great. And the thing they, that people didn't think through, particularly the engineers, that you've got you're building a, a biomass all winter long because your bacteria are not working when it, that hard when the temperature is 30, 40 degrees outside. You're, you're trying to treat cold water. And bacteria, we know, love warmer water. So then every spring you come along and get a couple days 80 degrees and that, those lagoons start warming up. You put warm air through there and all of a sudden there's a biomass in there that, that is just astronomical. And, and you can't get enough oxygen there to, to override that, that demand, that oxygen demand. So that's where we end up with, then it went, we call septic, and it smelled like a, smelled like a septic tank. And that's exactly what happened, because it, it, instead of an anaerobic uh, uh, digestion, it went the other way to aerobic, and, and we ended up with the, the, the high odor content. So we've, you know, treat things entirely, and again, that's evolved. And, and uh, now we actually treat the waste before it goes in the lagoons, and we, we aerate it. We actually have oxygen out there, a supply of oxygen from the oxygen people here in Buffalo, and uh, if it gets, and we need to, we can put straight oxygen in there, and then we treat it again before it goes. To, in fact, we're we're discharging, we're discharging water to the municipal sewer plant almost as good as they're distrib distributing to the to the stream. So, uh, you know, it's, it's when it's working, it's working great. But it it's taken you know a lot of a lot of development through the the waste treatment industry. And, and over the years, as, as well as certainly our upgrading of the, the system, so it's it's been one of the real challenges of, of life is that lagoon system. I'll tell you, I've got a few gray hairs over that baby, yeah, really. to say the least. But now, where are they located? Are they located like right by Perry's property, or are they off? They're about a quarter of a mile away. They're yeah, behind the whiting, you know, the whiting overhead door is, yeah. and a little bit beyond that is a piece of land that uh, we own back in there behind whitings. 
I think it's about a quarter mile, half mile back into there. So down to right Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> well, it was nice meeting you. Good to meet you. I hope I answered some of your questions. And if you want to talk again, just give me a holler. Okay. I can reminisce forever. <laughs> Mr. Perry. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> you get on